Hello my friends, welcome back. Today, the surviving game begins once again. We did Monday, now we're gonna do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But you know what didn't survive today? Yes, the Russian border. I am saying this now and I wouldn't have believed I'm ever going to say this, but Ukrainian tanks today morning, actually two hours ago when I'm shooting this video, crossed the Russian border into Russia. Armored fighting vehicles, tanks, I mean, infantry fighting vehicles. We're talking about the Russian Volunteer Corps and the Siberian Battalion. Now, the interesting part here is that the Russian Volunteer Corps only consists of fighters that have the Russian citizenship. So technically it is not the Ukrainians fighting in Russia right now, it is Russian citizens. So technically it's not Ukraine, it's Russian opposition. Although all of their weapons come from Ukraine. The tanks that entered Russia are from Ukrainian army, the weapons that they're firing from are from the Ukrainian army. So. I can still get away with saying Ukrainian tanks just entered Russia. Now with the first 10 minutes of this video we're gonna go through one by one what exactly happened, where did they penetrate the Russian border, drones, cyber attacks, this is a full Bond action movie. Let's begin. Today morning it all started with a huge massive Ukrainian drone attacks against Kursk and Belgorod Oblast and more specifically oil refineries and electrical power plants. Altogether we're talking about more than 25 different drones and they did reach their target with pinpoint accuracy. How do we know? Well, because every Russian that drives by that huge fire is filming it as you can see from the footage actually. But in addition to Kursk and Belgorod which are bordering Ukraine from from the east and northern part, drones also flew to six other regions, altogether eight regions of Russia. Information about the explosion came from Moscow, Tula, Bryansk, Belgorod, Kursk and Voronezh regions. It is known about the arrival of oil refineries Orolvskaya and Nizhnyhorodskaya. As a result of the drone attacks in Belgorod Oblast, power lines were damaged, seven settlements remained without electricity, air defense, supposedly according to Russian information, shot down 25 UAVs and that's from Ministry of Defense. Of course when we look at the footage and the photos <laughs> there's, there's no doubt that these drones connected to their targets. This, this, you cannot, yep, we have footage. <clears throat> and this eerie video shows you Belgorod, the biggest city close to Ukrainian border, about 30 kilometers from Ukrainian border, blasting air raid sirens full blast, everybody heard it, everybody filmed it, the war has finally reached the Russian citizens. Although in Belgorod one could argue that it's not Belgorod, it's Pilhorod and it has a lot of pro-Ukrainian uh, citizens. So we will see, this time will soon come when we will actually see. All right now the drones hit Settlements without electricity, huge but ba a boom here, huge but a boom there. Oil refineries are burning. What's next? Well, I'm glad you asked because a huge, massive Ukrainian cyber attack hit next, and that's uh, about a few hours ago from this moment. Right now, it's 10:30 a.m. in Estonia, same time in Ukraine. A few hours ago, this huge, massive cyber attack hit, and the Russian media and the Russian Ministry of Digital Development make notice that a number of electronical services of the Bil Bilhorod, let's call it with the right name, Ukrainian name, Bilhorod region such as electronical document management are unreachable due to cyber attacks. So drone attack very successful. Cyber attack very successful. The only thing that now is lacking is a real attack. <laughs> well I'm glad you brought that up. Now I'll bring you the message from the leader of the Russian Volunteer Corps. It's two minutes long. We'll watch the whole thing because it's so important. Because right after this message the Russian Volunteer Corps and the Siberian Battalion penetrated the Russian border from three different locations, two of them straight to Belgorod and one of them to Kursk Oblast. Now let's watch the message. Dear fellow citizens, when, <clears throat> when KABs flew from Belgorod, the once friendly Kharkiv, to the once friendly Kharkiv, Moscow cheered. When border regions were shelled in response, to Putin's policies, Moscow was silent. When you were taken as me to the front line, far from home and loaded into Orozaks, Moscow laughed. We are not coming to kill, to erase. 
to destroy or to punish. We come to free you from poverty, from misery, from uncertainty, from the dictatorship of a terrorist organization that has seized power. To give your children a normal civilized future without sanctions and repression, without choiceless choice, without talking about important things, but with important values. Without war, Putin usurped power for 20 years. And what happened? Sanctions, economic stagnation, a bloody war that took the lives and health of more than 400,000 Russian men, murdered competitors, complete isolation from the world stage, and beautiful palaces in Kelenjik and Novo Ogarevo. <coughs> and now he plans to go for another term and rule un until his death. We won't allow it. We are Russians like you. All of these men are Russian citizens. They, many of them still have Russian passports. They have every right to fight for their country and their values inside that country because Putin has usurped, taken away that possibility from them to live in Russia. We too have the right to express our will. And our will is not to recognize a bloody dictator as president of Russia. We will do everything we can to get him to move from Nova Ogaryova to Polar Wolf. We know how they treat the locals there. The Legion is going to the elections. Wait for us. What a message, what a powerful message. And you know what happened straight after that message? You guessed it, Ukraine. I just, I wanna say it one more time, it's such a beautiful sentence. Ukrainian tanks, armored fighting vehicles, penetrated into Russia, crossed the Russian border from three different locations. Now let's go into it. What happened exactly one by one? Now my friends, you see on the map, Russia and Ukraine, this is the border and this is a small village right here. It all began right here. This small village is called Lozova Rutka. This one right here. Now I'll zoom out to <laughs> try to not make you dizzy, so I'll zoom out slow. But you can see where it is, a little bit north uh, west from Kharkiv. This village is under Ukrainian control, liberated by the Russian Volunteer Corps by the time of making this video fully under the Ukrainians. Now this footage you see right here of the man running, this is a Russian Volunteer Corps fighter taking position in the village. This footage comes from that very village of Lozovaya Rutka. So we have footage of Ukrainians being in the village. Actually, <laughs> I must be per correct with the words of Russians being in that village, but the good Russians. At the time of making this video, there are two more places, two more villages where battles are raging on and they're completely from different areas. One of them is Tetkino Kuchy. So it's just completely different oblast, but also Ukrainian border. You can see this is more like northern, eastern Ukraine when Kharkiv is here. This is hundreds of kilometers away. I'll zoom into it again. And this, by the time of making the video, is not under Ukrainian control, but the battles are very fiercely going on right here in Tetkino. We can see the post office right here, Tetkino post office. We can see Krasnoya Bele, uh, I don't know what is, red, white something, restaurant maybe. And now the third place, my friends, where battles are raging on right here, right now in this minute I'm talking is Novaya Davaljanka. I'll zoom out so you see where it is. It's northeast from Kharkiv over the Russian border and it's only 30 kilometers from Belgorod city. This city right here and we talk about Belgorod. Oh what is you know it, it's a huge city. I'll zoom into the urbanized area you can see there is no way this city can be like taken with force if there is pro-Russian mindset in here. How this city could be liberated if the city does itself from inside by taking the police and military stations, fire fighting stations, train stations, stuff like that. You cannot take such a huge city with force because now I'll come to the real information that many people right now maybe want to ignore uh, because everybody's hooraying and I'm now talking about the very pro-Ukrainian uh, military bloggers who don't really 
look at the real information. Now to occupy or liberate, whatever you call it, any kind of land in long term, you need logistics, you need men, you need equipment, everything. Unfortunately, that is all that the Russian Volunteer Corps and the Siberian Battalion do not have. They are two battalions. They're not entire brigades or armies. They're battalions, meaning this is a raid. I'm sorry to bring down your... This is a great news that they have crossed into Russia, but... They are battalions. If you know how big is a battalion, then you know that this is and always can only be a raid. Raid means you go in for a few days, maybe a few weeks, and then you pull back out. It's not a force to uh, long-term occupy an area, control an area in enemy territory. It's not possible. So that's how the situation is. Now, if any people in the internet right now are saying, oh, okay, the civil war has begun, now we're liberated up until the Moscow, not with these forces. I'm sorry to bring you that news. No, this is a raid. It does a lot of damage to the Russian uh, defense capabilities, to the image of it. They definitely demilitarize a lot of Russians and their equipment, and then they pull back out. Why is it good? Well, because it minimizes the Russian Volunteer Corps losses. Hit and run in a way. Only a week or two weeks long hit and run. When Russians consolidate a huge force against them, they pull back. Why is it doing so much damage to the Russians? Well, because moving huge reserves to fight a small incursion into your territory, that takes a lot of resources, organization, time, everything. And if Russian Volunteer Corps is able to pull that out of the Russians, that's a huge victory already. Now, I'll say it again, this force is not there to re-liberate Moscow or Belgorod. This force is there to draw in huge Russian reserves to push this attack back. And then they'll just go back and Russians already have moved huge amount of their manpower, wasted huge amount of their time and energy to move them into an area where they're not really needed. That is a hugely successful hit and run operation. Very, very well done. Now, some people who are not connected to military terms might think that if you hit and run, if you go in, you liberate territory and go back out, it's a loss because they only think liberate the territory is victory. No, my friends. Wasting enemy's time, resources, deploying enemy's troops into the wrong positions because you force them to, that is a real victory. And that's what's happening right here. All right, my friends, I know you've been waiting for it for a long time. I say Ukrainian tanks entered Russia. Well, here is footage. This is very close to the Russian border. We're talking hundreds of meters and a Russian man filming Russian uh, volunteer core tank entering Russia. Oh my god, this sentence has so many Russia in, in it. Well, it's, yeah, and troops are following behind. So, Ukrainian tanks in Russia, of course, driven by Russian citizens. It's, it's, it's a weird situation. And in this video, a Siberian volunteer battalion fighter in Russia saying right now, don't vote in ballots. Well, because elections are very close in Russia right now. He says, vote with caliber, meaning vote with your weapons. This is all a message to Russian citizens in Russia. Now to give you a short overview before I move on about the what many people now would call a civil war, then no, definitely it's not a civil war. It's a hit and run. It's a raid, meaning it's temporary, but also meaning that it's incredibly successful. Hit and runs don't demand much from you, but they demand a lot from the enemy. So that's, this is what it is, wasting Russia's potential and power. Now, Kharkiv North area, two of the incursions over the border happened here, right south from Belgorod and north from Kharkiv. And one of them happened from north west to Sumy, this city right here, uh, Tetkino, Kursk Oblast, right here. And Kursk is this city here. And of course, it was uh, before uh, this land incursion happened, there was a cyber attack and a huge massive drone attack. A very, very successful day on this Ukrainian-Russian border for the Ukrainians. Drone attack, dro um, cyber attack, and then a successful incursion hit and run into Russian territory. Slava Ukraini, my friends. It's beautiful. Now we can move on. And I was talking already about a little bit about the huge importance of the elections in Russia, which are coming up very soon. And this incursion, into Belgorod has everything to do with those elections. It is to show the Russian people that Putin is not able to protect the Russian borders, which is the truth. He is not able to because the borders are so big. But now we have some leaked documents. What are Putin's plans after the election? And of course, he will wait. He's, he's a very patient man. He will wait after the elections to do this stuff. I'll read you a few threads. Putin's plan for post-election tyranny. Tightening the screws is just the start. 
Ukraine's cyber resistance. Well, Ukrainian hackers leaked these documents to us. A cover for restructuring Russia's shadow power. Billions poured into project not just for rebuilding, but for military and political might, under the guise of academic research. Documents with Putin's mark detail the shilling intent. So this is documents that Putin has approved and they're leaked to own the economy, to cage the media, to purge the Western thought. Totalitarianism isn't coming, it's here. We're not talking that uh, Russia is going to the Soviet times under Gorbachev or under Brezhnev or even under Khrushchev. They're going, or they're already there, under Stalin, the most strict, totalitarian, closed-off economy. This is where Putin is steering Russia right now, and he has plans and documents ready to put all of these ideas into motion straight after the election in March. Total control, censorship amped up, Western influence purged. The playbook is out. It's fast-tracked to dictatorship. They're not hiding it anymore. This is all I'm going to read, but we get an idea of Putin's plans. He is not doubling down, but tripling, quadrupling down, because he has no way back. As soon as he loosens his grip right now, people in Russia want more freedom. And Navalny proved it. People, as soon as they're let, people will come to the street and they want Putin out. So his only way to survive and to stay in power is to double down or triple down. And this is what he's doing. So we can expect from Russia in the next year or two, full totalitarian, closed conflict country, closed economy, full total control. And we know what happens to countries with full total control. Well, the Soviet Union collapsed and all other countries with full total control are also not doing that great. So Russia is in a downward spiral in the long term. Also to illustrate the point even further, this is straight back to Stalin's times. Russia, in attempt to prevent leaks of government secrets, Putin signed an order prohibiting former government officials from traveling abroad. Only a special commission can authorize foreign travel. Now, this foreign travel special commission was very big in the Soviet Union. Everybody who went, even as tourists, had to go there for interviews and briefings. Uh, if, like the KGB was talking to them. Putin is bringing all of that back. Everything. Just copying from the Soviet Union. And we all know how it was in the Soviet Union. It was garbage. So he's basically bringing garbage to Russia. Bringing the garbage system back. I don't know why he likes it so much. It was so bad. Nothing worked. Now, my friends, time to give credit where credit is due. And that's the Czech nation. The Czech president, Petr Pavel, made the possible, made the impossible possible. And not only organized 800,000 artillery shells for Ukraine, but also financing. Around 1.5 billion euros have been organized and the ammunition will arrive in the coming weeks. Yes, now people are so desensitized um, about artillery shells. Everybody has been talking about them for the last two years, all different numbers of this country and that country sending this and that amount. My friends, 800,000 shells will change a lot. This is about half a year's artillery shell necessity for Ukrainian armed forces. It changes everything. Ukraine is only able to destroy Russians as much as they have artillery shells and drones. They now have the drones, but they don't have shells at all. They shoot 2,000 a day, Russians shoot 10,000. With these 800,000 that will reach Ukraine in a matter of one month, it changes Russian losses 50 to 75%, I would say, in my estimates. So right now we're seeing 1,000 KIAs per day on Russian side. We might get to 2,000. Because let's say 50 man like, units, Russian units, strikes Ukrainian positions. They're minced up, meaning, you know, Ukraine fires a few shells, they're stopped, the fighting vehicles are destroyed. Half of the troops get killed, half of the troops run back. Why are the other half able to run back? Well, because Ukraine is not able to saturate, no, oversaturate the battlefield area with shells. If they are able to do that, nobody makes it back. This is what I mean by increase by 50, maybe 75% of Russian losses. So these 800,000, they change everything. So yeah, Czech people and President Petr Pavel, thank you. I don't always thank you in Czech, but uh, yeah, well done. And this dude is not yet finished. The Czech, look at this, like the, the photo of this man already. 
gives you an idea. Okay, I can take him seriously. He's a serious man who does what he says. And he's not done yet. NATO troops could carry out support activities directly on Ukrainian territory, as this would not violate any international rules, Czech President Petr Pavel said in an, in an interview. So he is for NATO troops in Ukraine carrying out non-combat activities, non-combat responsibilities. I do respect this guy. He has the balls to stand up to Russia. We need people like that in the leadership, in the power in Europe. We have them in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, also in Finland, in Poland, all the countries next to Russia. Coincidence? I think not. But we also have the Czech president. Thank you, Czech people, for voting correctly. Now, my friends, quite the opposite. I'm talking about the Petr Pavel, Czech president, or a man who stands up to tyranny. Now we're talking quite about the opposite. We're talking about a man who is afraid, who has no balls, who is afraid to take responsibility, take, afraid to fight, afraid to stand up to tyranny. And this is Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor. I'm done. I have, or, I have given him credit. Okay, Germany has sent some and some. Thank you to the German people for sending the aid the German government has sent. But I would not give any credit to Olaf Scholz at all anymore. I'm done with him. He doesn't want to send the Taurus. Now, the United Kingdom came out with a perfect idea. Okay, Germany, you, you have no balls. You want to send the Taurus perhaps to us so we can send the Storm Shadow. So we will take the blame and the fire. The UK is ready to sacrifice themselves, their name. We will send Storm Shadow, just replenish our stocks with Taurus missiles. And Olaf Scholz is like, no, I don't give it to Ukraine and I don't give it to our allies. So Olaf Scholz has lost all respect in my eyes. He has no balls, he has no spine to stand up to tyranny, to fight for his, this generation right here. Time to act is right now, right at this moment. And he doesn't, he's inactive. He is afraid to take that step and everybody's expecting that step. My friends, but now on a different topic to give you a good feeling when you go from this video because that is the goal. If you watch information about this war, the only way to keep you connected and keep you informed is not to scare you and make you feel good. That's like if any news outlet makes you feel scared, desensitized, confused, stop following that news outlet. Stop their using you. You need to feel good in your life to be able to do any good in this world. So let's watch a positive video. The Swedish flag has been raised in the NATO headquarters and the Swedish princess is singing a Swedish anthem next to it. This is a proud moment for Swedish people, for NATO people, but also me as an Estonian right now physically in Tallinn, 250 kilometers from the Russian border. Our northern border as a country that doesn't have an efficient or any kind of navy to speak of, or any kind of air force to speak of getting accepted Finland and Swedish armies in NATO, our northern border, our you know, Baltic Sea coastline of north and west just got like 500% more secure. So I have to thank the Finnish people and the Swedish people for doing this because you greatly benefited my personal security in Estonia right now. So thank you. Skull. All right, my friends, that is it. Very good news today. And I will say it one last time because I don't think I can say this for a long time after today's video. Ukrainian tanks crossed into Russia. Hell yeah. Until my tomorrow's video. Be back. I'll upload again tomorrow. Slava Ukraini and bye bye.